All right then, we can do this, all right. Deep breath ready? Stretching, ready. Always with the stretching. <sighs> Listeners and welcome to episode 29 of the Peaky Bastards podcast and the first episode that we are uh, recording while in official lockdown. So if you uh, if you have a listen, if you spend 50 minutes listening to us and then think, why did I do that? At least you can tell yourself that there was nothing else you could have possibly been doing anyway. <laughs> so it's all good. Um, I'm here with Nick Parker, who is locked in Ultranum. How are yeah. you, Nick? Hello, I'm all right. How are you? I'm not too bad, mate. I'm not too bad. And yeah, Matt Paul, who is over in New York. <laughs> how long have you been in lockdown? And I nearly called you Nat Paul. That was, was all that say, happened. How long have you been called yeah, Matt, Matt say, Because he didn't seem to know your name. So We've, we've known each other for over a decade. <laughs> Do you want me to call you name? Nat Paul? I can call you Nat Paul if you want. I'm good. I'm good. So we're here to actually talk about music. Today we have four recently released albums. One classic, and then I will be talking about an artist that I love. Um, the recently released ones are Ground with Anthropocene, Against All Logic with 2017 to 2019, which is such an imaginatively imagin- titled album. Um, <laughs> Kicks off already before we H- even get to the HMLTD, yeah. <laughs> HMLTD with West of Eden. Do I review a little quiz for you now? Do you know what HMLTD stands for? Happy Meal Limited. Ah, you do. Damn it. Winner. What is um, it? What is it? Happy Meal Limited. Right. Yeah. That makes total um, sense to me. Yes. And then we have Square Pusher with B Up A Hello, which again, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> and the, <laughs> the classic for this month is In Excess with Kicks. Um, and then I will be telling you all why I love Aldous Harding. And I put a playlist together for that. So let's get straight into it. I'm going to go to Nick and ask him, Nick, which song had the best verse? And was it on your favourite album on the list? The song, which was not on my favourite album on the list is okay. the song Deefers from Against All Logic. Um, okay. And I say that, and I know I'm bending the rules here, because it really isn't a verse at all. There are no verses yeah. or choruses in this <laughs> song or any of this song. So you just ignored my question. <laughs> so I'm bending the rules, I realise, but when it comes down yeah, well, to Yeah, well, the it, reason I ask these questions is because there was a quite lack of choruses and verses on this playlist. There so was. So you're try. making it awkward for us, and I'm refusing yeah. to allow yeah. you to, so yeah. All right, um, fair enough. But Deefa's, um is is my favourite sort of track on the playlist as a whole. I think it's. Um, but I'll go back a little bit and talk about Against the Logic as an album, I suppose, um, and just say that it was uphill struggle for me to get into this album because any genre without lyrics, we've talked about this before. I think any genre without lyrics per se is, although there's a lot of samples of vocals, I realise is always going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, but I, in the end, I sort of managed to get my mind into it by thinking about how it was similar to Mass Attack in some ways, um, mm. where the ingredients are often a kind of mix of com- complicated percussion, vocal samples, and then really sort of swooping synthesizers and stuff. Uh, and those kind of elements all put together. Um, so there's a, track, there's a track on the album with, a, with an addict, which I think is a really good example of that. But anyway, yeah. moving back to my favorite, D, Defers, which is D, I think it's five E's, F E. It's got five F-E-R-S, E's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really nicely overdriven at points. It's um, it really uh, kind of breaks down in interesting ways and it's kind of glitchy in interesting ways. Um, and I thought it was probably the most energizing song of the whole playlist. Uh, and there's a lot of electronic okay. on this playlist, so I feel like it was that's that's quite a big statement in some respects. There's a lot of kind of sort of upbeat driving beats in this in this selection of, of albums. Um, yeah. So and then. I would really, if we hadn't gone this way round, I would really like to talk about how it compares to one of the other albums, um, but we'll come back to that, I suppose, later on. We'll come so, back yeah, to that, yeah, I will. So, yeah, so, so Deefers is, is my favourite song uh, with my favourite verse, in inverted commas, on it. Uh, Can you please if, demonstrate this verse to me now, please? Of lyrics, you mean? Yeah, No, there's actually the no words whatsoever, but there's, there's yeah. a verse structure... Cheated. There's a verse structure in the melody of it, but I'm not going to sing it, so you can just forget that. I should have known you'd be a technical arsehole about this question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the verse isn't just the lyrics, though, is it? It could also be the structure of the repetition. It's true. Of it's true. Melody, yeah. So. Aha! Yeah. Touché. Okay. So, yeah, so that's, that's against the logic for me. Okay. I mean, I was going to go to Matt, but I'm going to jump in because you talked about Deefers. Um Cool. So, yeah, parts of this album genuinely offend my ears really badly. Um, <laughs> there's a run of songs from If You Can't Do It, Good, do it hard to Deefers. 
that at times made me want to stop listening to music forever. Is that um, including Deefers as well? Including yeah, including Deefers. Deefers is <laughs> horrible. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd jump in because you've just given it such praise. Um, mm. I hated those songs straight away as soon as I heard them, and I continued to hate them throughout the month of listening. Um, to me, it's just a bit too bleepy. It's a bit too 90s garage at times, some of this, and it, it sometimes it reminded me of like Artful Dodger and all that horrible stuff. Um, so for a while I was kind of judging this whole album on just those three tracks um, and yeah I never fell in love with anything on this album but I did find some of the songs more enjoyable as I went through um, some of the more soulful songs such as If Loving You Is Wrong um, but yeah overall this album it was just too much for it, me really it's not really my thing um, similar to what I said about Liturgy last time I don't feel like I'm the best judge um, because I don't feel like it's something that I, I know a lot about this genre but yeah, I won't be listening to it again. I can say that much. That's about me, really. How about you, Matt? Um, so f for me, this was kind of an album of two halves. Um, the first half being more of this instrumental hip hop kind of electronic style, mm. where you you may uh, Nick made comparisons to like Massive Attack. You also see uh, people like DJ Shadow, um, and don't hear any of this. Has, it's heavily like well, it's all like super heavily sampled, and it's like mm. um, it's trip hoppy, and I think generally more accessible, and it's quite interesting. Um, and then you have the second half, which is it delves more into just like the electronic side of things. Okay. Um, Can I ask where the line and, is between the two then? Because Defus is right in the middle of the album. I think it's Alarm, which is just before Defus. Ah, so this is the electronic, the more pure electronic yeah. side. Right, I see. Yeah. But like I like I like the second half as well for me. I just think it doesn't fit so well together. Mm. Um, like Alarm and Defus, I found really interesting the way that he was using the sound to just feel like the music, like everything was you were surrounded by it almost. Mm. The all the different tones and it was just all it was almost discombobulating and kind of claustrophobic. Mm. Uh, and I you really, have one I big really... word per podcast, you do, don't you? One big word that you like to pull out every episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. There is isn't no. for a couple of weeks now. Uh, well, that's why you've got that Shakespeare mug we saw earlier on the video, isn't it? We've been learning words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take one off there each day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, carry on. But yeah, I think it was, it was, it was interesting. I liked it. Um, I, I would say it tailed off towards the end as an album. The okay. Final three songs. Yeah. <laughs> Just Can we talk us? Then? <laughs> can, can we talk as a group about how bad if you can't do it good do it hard is, is, is well isn't it? i i like that it's a really to, yeah it oh my wasn't God. my favorite on the album it's, i'll say that but i mean i i thought it still had a lot of energy which a lot of the it's album a quite did. A famous sample as well um, yeah yeah i know the sample and oh. she is a collaborator of his so i believe I say I only read right. yesterday when I was reading a review. This is like this is Nicholas Jar, isn't it? It's his yeah sort of yeah. Which I don't know Nicholas Jar, but I know that I, he's sort of ambient electronic music, isn't it? Usually quite chilled stuff. So I mean, this is like his other he, his other he, alias, isn't it? Yeah, he has several guises, yeah. and so okay. yeah, he does a lot of ambient stuff, which is really uh, peaceful. And this like the last album under this alias was really highly rated. Okay. Um. So I thought it would, would be worth. Listen. And do you think and you knew that previous album? Did you, Matt? I've I've had listened to it a little bit, and I th I don't think this is as interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. But I still found some stuff in it that was good. So it's worth digging into the earlier stuff then, potentially for Mike for me, yeah. since I was fairly yeah into it. yeah okay yeah I think so. Right. Great. Okay. Cool. 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 All right then, Matt. Over to you. So, which song did you think had the best chorus on the playlist, and uh, was it on your favorite album? Um, so yeah, I think we've alluded to this. This is a really shitty question. Um, yeah, really, it's, it's a bullshit question that he's done just to fuck us up. We had... I, think, I think the fantastic questions, they're my favourite questions we've ever put together, actually. But like, there's really not even the even the the more traditional albums have yeah. not that many, much core structure or verse structure. That's <laughs> obvious. Uh, I loved it when I thought of so, this question I thought that's going to fuck him over I love this so I spent a long time actually yeah this is, was at least half an hour just like going through songs like what 
is where's yes. the chorus? Uh, this was a success. This was exactly what I was aiming for. I've killed it. Sorry. Uh, but but come so on, chorus me. I settled on uh, HMLTD okay. uh, with our album West of Eden and specifically the song To The Door. Okay. Um, mostly because I just really enjoyed this song. Um, and the way the chorus, uh, if I were going to talk specifically about um, To The Door, I think yeah. the, like, the tone of the song, the, this kind of whole spaghetti western vibe, <clears> um, <throat> is really kind of fun. And then... Mm that is really really reinforced by the chorus where you have these like who and ha's and like <laughs> shouting and hollering um, and then it ends with the like um the refrain and it's like weird and then you realize like i feel like you realize at that point that this song has a lot more going on than just like a simple pop song and um, and there's all kind of things that i could read into it but for me it felt like like western to me means like peak white masculine culture mm. and so having that kind of the rug taken from underneath that um and with the the lyrics about trying to like escapism and trying to escape while someone's trying to trap you inside because they're scared of the outside i thought it had a lot more interesting things going on um, Interesting. generally i thought this album had i again i i compare this to a different album we'll talk to later but i think it was quite interesting and complicated it was like they'd taken lots of motifs from the past 30 40 years blended them and came up with something um still incredibly poppy and still incredibly referential but also um new and different okay. there's also just so much energy in this album so but... referential is another fancy word we can't have two in one episode i'm afraid that's overloading the system <laughs> so. <laughs> uh yeah, especially in the playlist after the end of um, Against All Logic, yeah, which kind of peters out. This really, like, this was really a shot in the arm. So for the second half of the question, Matt, is, is this your favourite album on the playlist then? Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Are you done? It sounds yeah. like it. Nick, do you want to talk about HMLTD? Yeah. Um, so when he says it's complex, I, I, to me, this album is bizarre, like really bizarre. And I, I don't know mm. that I mean that in a very complimentary way, honestly. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a really strange, got a really strange trajectory across like sets of about three or four songs. It's quite a long album, isn't it? It's quite mm. a lot of tracks on it. Um, yeah. When you start the first maybe three, two or three songs, certainly West is Dead, and then what's the one after that? Um, Loaded. Loaded. Yeah, so those songs um, I wasn't really into because I felt like they were really trying too hard to be cool. They really trying to, they sounded like they wanted to be badly be in the Matrix soundtrack. <laughs> just yeah. really trying to have that, that like super slick, like tight, overdriven bass and stuff. And um, yeah. as someone who generally prefers the kind of, I suppose it's the illusion of witnessing something genuine um, in, in like when musicians perform. It seemed very stylized to the point where mm. it kind of made, to be honest, it kind of made my skin crawl a little bit the way it was, it seemed really, <laughs> really over the top mm. of that. So that was one assessment. And I'll say that it sound, one thing it did sound like, which I thought um, a band it did sound like, which people may be into is Placebo. And if they're into what? this band, I think they might like to dig into Placebo because I think there was some stuff in these first two songs I'm talking about. But then the yeah, album becomes bizarrely different, as and and Matt alluded to how it gets into this like weird old west like noodling like spaghetti western <laughs> guitar tracks, <laughs> the ballad of Calamity James, and then also you mentioned yeah. to the door to the door as well. That is just a really strange and uh, far from going to for me ultra slick, ultra cool, you know, like like matrix like to to this is is a really jarring juxtaposition i found it mm. a bit dis discombobulating in fact Matt. i find it discombobulating yeah um but then then it does another really weird turn in satan luella and i and mikey's song into like more like disco sort of stuff which seemed to me to be a, another huge leap which i didn't really join it on really i, I didn't really wasn't able <laughs> to go with it wasn't really able to go with it on that um so in the end um there's a couple of songs that I think people 
a different sh- taste will like in various different tastes will like actually but I could I'm be hard pressed to find people who like all of it consistently and I'd be hard pressed to believe that Matt does in fact but I'll see what he thinks in a minute about that comment but uh yeah so to me it just seems like an all over the shop basically yeah yeah Matt what do you think do you do you like all of it uh, I think I like all of it I I yeah. agree it's not cohesive I think they tried like the like the interlude song, the, the mm. before the spaghetti western, as I think is their attempt to transition. <laughs> and the fact that the line is... before a spaghetti western comes into an album review is is upsetting to me. Yeah, it is. It is jarring. It does feel almost like it? a compla- compilation, yeah, um, yeah, as opposed to an album. But I think yeah. that might be they've drawn on lots of their songs that they've created because it's their first album, I think. Right. Yeah, I did see the Needle Drop review, and he said that "To the Door" was a single about three, four years ago. So uh, yeah, I think maybe makes... they have been piecing it together for a while. Oh, yeah, right. that makes sense. Um, yeah, for me, I just thought this was an absolute fucking car crash. Um, <laughs> it's a total mess. Um, not a single redeeming feature, as far as I can see. Oh um, my god, this is going to go down as really, the worst playlist for Fran and Elf. Really dramatic, absolutely. incredibly dramatic. Lyrically, I thought it was really, really childish um i don't think it knows what it wants to be it's just really bad um i haven't got loads more to say but one of the things that really we really struggled with was his his voice is so irritating um makes me want to get violent um and i also thought like the chelsea wolf <laughs> album that we talked about last last episode there's just this inauthentic sheen of darkness over it um, I think it's just I loads of overblown pop tunes. As well, yeah, 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 the words you were yeah, using yeah. about that, I, I agree totally. Um, so yeah, it's really un- inauthentic, it's overblown. On several occasions, it's just plain annoying. Um, so yeah, I got absolutely nothing from it, and I genuinely <laughs> hope I never have to hear any of it again. Um, <laughs> that's about all I've got to say on in that these, one. In these but, dark times, it's going to be lovely for our audience to hear somebody eviscerate an yeah. album that viciously. That's so, that's so yeah. pleasing to the ear. Well, you know, what what can I say? I'll be honest. I mean, I think yeah. this this didn't help that, you know, and I'm going to talk about this more in a bit, but the fact that this was the playlist and the, this album was one of the albums I had to listen to while I was sort of getting used to being stuck at home, it was really hard to listen to this album in this circumstance because it was really annoying while I was already sort of finding the world a bit mad. So, yeah. Mm. But anyway, let's move on. Um, Nick, yes. I don't know if we've spoken about your favourite, have we? We haven't, no. No, can we speak about your favourite? Yes. Uh, we will talk then about Square Pusher. Uh, oh, Square wow. Pusher's uh, Be Up a Hello, which okay. is a grammatical road accent in itself. Um, yeah. What, what does that mean? Let's just talk about that. What does Be Up a Hello mean? I Anyone? Have absolutely no idea. Matt? Matt? Oh, no idea. Yeah. No? Great. Doesn't tell you on your Shakespeare mug. <laughs> no. Um, no? All right. So to me... Um, when I first heard it, I think actually the first couple of tracks on it, I was I was quite surprised. I, I had expected it to be a bit a bit darker. I knew I, knew, I didn't know the, the work except to say that I knew it was like electronic, like quite extreme, like electronic beats and stuff, and you know very sort of purist electronica. Um, I have a friend actually in America who's I think really into this band and and is sort of obsessed about electronica in general. Mm. Um, so I expected to be a lot more sort of almost nastier than it was at the start. Like the opening song, o- Oberlove, Oberlove, um, yeah. was, was really kind of sunny, actually, kind of, kind of joyous and sunny. And I found that really kind of hard to adjust to initially, but I, I did get into it in the end. Um, and occasionally, um, it was a bit too clean and bright for me, but in general, um, I really like the ways in which it sounded glitchy and broken up and, and like some bands that I really like, like Aphex Twin we've talked about before, mm. like Floating Point, who I'm really into as well. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I was trying to be cynical about it, you know, I'd do a fran, basically. I would say that the worst <laughs> parts of it, it sounds like a computer game, tr- like backing track. It does that's sound the, like a computer game backing track. That's, that's the worst of it. But I think a lot of it just sounds busy complex engaging and kind of uh and fun honestly and i I really enjoyed a lot of it my favorite song on it is speed crank um it's so unbelievably complicated um without any kind of underpinning of a basic song's construction like say a verse or a chorus this is another one i was possibly (laughs) going to select when i talked about uh my favorite verse 
Um, but yeah, it doesn't have a structure at all that I can discern. And yeah, it moves through the, the narrative of the song really, really interestingly and really well. So, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'm not saying it's my favorite album of the year or anything. Uh, and obviously it's in the shadow of little Sims. So how could it, you know, how could it really compete? <laughs> but, um, but wow. no, I mean, in the end, it, I, I think it's really good and really worth coming back to. But I, you know, so I'm interested, yeah. Nick, I want to stick with you for a second because you often talk on the podcast about stuff without any lyrics and how that's really hard for you. So mm, mm. what, what was, what was different here? Yeah, I mean, what was different, I, I think you're dead right, and I talked about it, this is why I was going to say earlier on about the comparison between this and the Against All Logic, because uh, they're both, you know, in some respects, fairly similar albums, and they both have that lyrical, not limitation, but they just don't use a lot of lyrics. Um, mm. So it isn't easy to get into that stuff for me, but I think in this case, the layering is so complicated that there's, a lot, there's enough sort of distraction from the, the absence of that that it's okay with me. So like okay. things like Speed Crank are just all over the place and you're just thinking, how the hell do they do that? Uh, rather than where's the singer? So yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, that's how it works. Interesting. But I will say all that right. in, in, if I'm doing that comparison, now I can do that comparison, um, I would say I prefer this album overall. Um, and, but I think maybe Difas is still a better song than anything on this album, maybe. Okay, okay. Matt? Um, yeah, I... I didn't dislike this. I think I, on the other hand, preferred Against All Logic because I think it was a little bit more uh, accessible mm. than Square Pusher. Um, I thought with this, it, it was interesting the way it was kind of very precise but also chaotic and manic. Um, it felt like, to me, the first four songs just kind of blended together. They kind of mm. gradually amped up and everything went from this like very light dreamy tone to this kind of something much darker as you proceeded but it felt like a very gradual thing as opposed to four distinct tracks um and then and then it, there was just yeah there was this weird pause in the middle which was just very dreamy atmospheric which i i really dug i like a lot of the time like the like the whole vibe of the album i i was really into um and one of the things that i i, I did really like is the way he did use like eight bit sounds to to um to make I don't know something that did sound like a computer game and I actually have an appreciation for music in computer games as opposed to just automatically write it off and I think um what we had with Micro Bass particularly was uh really really something that was very nice um. It felt to me that I was playing, it was, did feel like a video game, but it felt very sinister, very dark and very interesting. Okay. Um, I think I read so something I think... about that he did record it on like an old, I'm just trying to look it up now, that he, he got like old equipment to record it on and there is some relation to a Commodore or something that he used. Yeah. So I think there was a real aim actually to get that sound. I don't think it's just yeah. a negative thing to say that it did. Right. It, it did say that I'm just reading the review about it now and it does mention like the eight bit computers and all sorts. Yeah, so I think it was I intentional that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that you guys should write off music just because it has that vibe. I'm, I don't you. do that. Well, I, you, you, I do a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't mind if it's and like these days, you know, music and games is, is, you know, very elaborate and basically, you know, it's yeah. identical, but I, I, I don't really enjoy as much stuff that's, so eight bit, but I don't mind a little bit of that yeah. being integrated here and there, and it is reasonably well in this case. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't. I I'd heard of this guy, and I was expecting to be blown away. I I know his contemporaries, like people talk about him, like they talk about Aphex Twin and yeah. Orteca, but uh, to me, it wasn't that. It wasn't as distinct or interesting, okay. but it, there was stuff. Well, Fat Roland, who's uh, one of our writers, he's a big electronic music fan, and he picked this as his best thing of the month um, last month or the month before, I think. So I mm -hmm. think um, you know, it is he is one of those, what I was reading about Square Pusher actually is that he is of that ilk of all those other artists you just may you mentioned, but he never kind of went away like a lot of them did. So in some yeah. ways, people have kind of not missed his music. So he's not he doesn't make as big a splash when he comes back with stuff. But he's been going for like twenty five years, so he's obviously. Had a pretty impressive career, but um, yeah, it's doing something yeah. right. Yeah, but for me, 
I I feel a bit again. I'm going to men- mention mention liturgy again. I feel a bit like I did about liturgy, and that I just don't feel that qualified to talk about this album. Um, that said, I did enjoy it more than than liturgy. It was more listenable for me. Um, mm. And I like the opening track Overlove, which which Nick mentioned earlier. Um, but then my big problem comes, and this goes into what you just said as well, Matt. When we go to the second track, uh, Hit Zonu, I can't really tell any difference between that one and the first one. Um, it's just kind of a lot of glitches over a summer, summary beat in the background. Um, and then we move to Nerve Levers and Speed Crank. Me and you are not agreeing on anything today, Nick, because <laughs> that's when it becomes a real challenge for me, this album. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about this kind of music because I don't, but these si- songs feel a bit more aggressive and a bit more to me i found them quite stressful and again like i said with um <laughs> happy meal limited it was not the kind of music i needed to get me through these last few weeks um <laughs> stressful is a really damning indictment isn't it yeah i find it quite stressful i mean well it's invoking then, an emotional response that's true yeah i mean i'm not i'm not saying in any way that i, I think this is bad i mean I, the next song after speed crank Detroit People Mover. I actually really like that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think when this album's on its gentler side, that's the kind of electronic music I actually quite enjoy. But for me, there's just not enough of that here in this album. So I'm not going to say that's a failing on the side of the music because I honestly don't know if this is a good example of its genre or not. I just know that really it's not particularly for me. A bit like and that's kind. Of... A bit like being in the shadow of Lil Sims. You can't can no longer say. I don't have vocabulary for this particular genre of music. You need to get some vocabulary. I, I never said. I yeah. never said that. I never. I didn't want to say the word vocabulary and everything. I just said. I just said I don't feel that qualified to like sort of to, to offer too much. You can't like that. You got. You can I haven't. I've just. Your, I've just said. I just said what on. I think of it. I've yeah, just totally I said think, what I think. But I, I just. Don't uh, we're qualified to talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel true. like there's a lot of music I've been listening to for my yeah, entire life, true. and I understand I'm definitely more qualified to talk about that than I am about Square Pusher, because mm. it's you know all I can say is it's not for me. There were some bits that I liked, there were some bits I didn't like. But if I'd have just said that, that would have been very boring. So I tried to say that in a longer way. But yeah, that's me for Square Pusher. Anyone else with anything for Square Pusher? No, I think that covers it. No. Nah. Oh. So I'm going to come to you, Matt. Do, which one out of In Excess or um, Grimes did you hate the most or dislike the most? Oh, In Excess. In Excess. Let's, cool. Go let's for do it. this. Um, so <laughs> I just just the front cover. It's got a skateboard on the front, and it just <laughs> they. they oh, that could be more of, more of putting than all the stuff that's wrong with Happy Meal Limited. You'll put up by a skateboard on the front. Okay, you okay, don't well, mind let's, spaghetti let's westerns. Just, this is the start of an of a, of a metaphor. Okay. <laughs> okay. Be ready. Well, I just think it it sums metaphor. up it sums up what they think about themselves and what they think about the band, and they pretty much this album feels like what they thought was cool in the eighties, in the late eighties specifically. Um, probably was and probably it feels was quite like, cool right but it also feels like just very um easy just snapshots of what they're just grabbing at whatever it is like listening to the music it felt like um copies almost of different artists that were also going at the same time who have um critical merit um and these guys just did a not very simple knockoff version like, Why is it necessary that I mean, who was the ones who were copying and not other artists? Because I mean, I'm not sure about the the timing around other bands. Why? Why? What makes you think these were the same. ones that were? This this came out on eighty. I wrote some down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Done your research. Done your research. Um, you're going to say Rolling Stones for one of them, aren't you? No, I'm going to no. say uh, The Cure. I'm going to say okay. uh, New Order. This came okay. out in eighty eight, and they came out with like Brotherhood came out in eighty six. Um, yeah. And that was like New Order's third album. And um, uh, The Cure came out with Kiss Me, Kiss Me in 87. And that had, I mean, like, just to me, like this album sounds like neither of those albums, though. Well, I can see I can see the, the vibe from those albums and little p- parts of where they take one part of the song mm-hmm. and then they make a, an entire song out of it. A super simple, sellable pop song mm. that isn't good. I think um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I think it's to me. It seems yeah. It's like they're just distilling the kind of new wavy aesthetic, and 
And the, I think I'm aiming really at the, the front end of the album. Towards the end, it just feels like they're copying. It's like a Bruce Springsteen cover band for me. <laughs> um, it's all just, it's all very straightforward. It's all very pedestrian. Isn't like, your wife a big fan of In Excess? Is this going to yeah, cost some Yeah, she has three, three records. <laughs> <laughs> it's the largest collection of any artist in our record. <laughs> record but Amazing. I don't, I don't know. It, and so the the one the artist I wanted to compare HMLTD to was this because okay, uh, like the, there's a lot of obviously same influences or they've been influenced by In Excess, but they're doing something way more. I know I know you guys didn't like it because it was a bit of a mess, but it was way more interesting and complex, and than this, which just felt very like there was just no substance and no depth to the music. Um, I just I found it super dull, and I I like eighties pop music, <laughs> and so yeah, I just just found it so it was just too much for me. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna jump in. Um, so when I first listened to this playlist in full, I mean we've spoke about most of the albums now. Um, I actually started to really look forward to NXS before I heard it because it wasn't I was expecting to love it, but from what I heard of them before I thought at least this was going to be something I'd be a bit more musically familiar with um something I could kind of grab onto a little bit um and then Guns in the Sky came on and I thought fucking hell this is horrible um <laughs> it's, it's like the archetypal overblown macho 80s rock that I've spent my entire life trying to avoid I think it's just a, a terrible opening song so at this point my excitement about NXS kind of totally tumbled, up, tumbled off a cliff um, and there are songs throughout the album that back up that initial assessment. I think The Loved Ones, Wildlife, yeah, they're not quite as bad as Guns in the Sky, but they're not a great listen. But actually, to my surprise after that first impression, there was a, a lot here that I could appreciate if I took it in its own context and time. Um, I think Michael Hutchins has a great rock voice. I think there are several songs here that like they're just catchy as hell, if we're being honest about it. Um, I think New Sensation, Devil Inside and Mystify are all examples. But I think... Probably the standout in that respect is Need You Tonight. Um, I think that little guitar riff in that song is fucking great. I love it. Um, and I think the chorus is a real earworm. I knew this song already, um, but I didn't know it was in excess. So I was quite quite a fan of that song. You know, I'm not going to say I'm going to go and get this on vinyl, but I quite liked it. Um, and then Never Tear Us Apart, I think it's cheesy as hell. But I think, if I'm being honest, it's probably something that I would call a guilty pleasure, even if I'm not sure whether I should feel guilty about it or not. Um, so I'd say in the end there was probably about half this album that I quite enjoyed and about half that I couldn't get into at all but I, I'm kind of glad we listened to it anyway um, I think it's glad, I'm glad we've covered it I don't think we've really covered an album like this before uh, like a classic 80s rock album so I'm quite glad that we have and I picked this because I watched the um, the documentary Mystify which is about Michael Hutchins' life um, and whatever you think of the music I'd really recommend watching that documentary is really really interesting um just to the perspective of like a not totally stable man growing up in this massive you know becoming really famous and trying to deal with all that it was really interesting which i don't know if having watched that gave me a little bit of a different perspective because when matt when you said that it was there wasn't much substance to it actually some of the songs i think i haven't seen the documentary they did have a bit more to say than than you are saying there i think but that's just just me but yeah, that's it for In Excess. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. Um, so yeah, Nick? Yeah, so um, when Matt said there's a skateboard on the cover, I thought, wow, we're just becoming a cliche of like <laughs> the reasons why we hate everything. <laughs> but actually, on reflection, I think Matt makes a really, really good point about what I would refer to as tokenism in this album. Um, yeah. Because it's very keen to put in little gestures which are indicative of something else that's more significant. And I think Matt's spoken about it really well already with all the other bands and actually dating the albums and stuff. Um, so, for example, Need You Tonight, I mean, that song is, it is earworm, but it's extremely irritating as well that it just can't, you can't <laughs> get rid of that hook. It's like a tiny <laughs> little... Dun, I love that little hook, man. Oh, so Brilliant. It's, it's really difficult. But I will say, I, I didn't absolutely hate it. And... Um, although I think Matt's also right, honestly, that, that the HM, what is it, LTD, uh, is yeah. a more inventive album overall. 
Uh, but which is really hard to compare given this is so much older. This is yeah. so much older. Yeah, so, I think it's a hard yeah. thing to say for an 88 album and a 2020 album. You yeah, know. that's a fair point. But um, HMLTD is inventive, but what is it inventing? Yeah. That's I true. mean, is it inventing a horrible that? genre of music that we're going to have to put up with <laughs> yeah. for the next 10 years? Because I really hope not. <laughs> Let's hope not, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I will say that I, f- I did feel, and I haven't seen the documentary, but obviously I'm, I'm aware of the circumstances uh, with what happened with that band and with, with mm. Michael Hutchins in particular. And uh, it made me feel like it was, I felt really uncomfortable about saying negative things about it because I know it was a very sad story um, about what happened with them. But yeah. in the end, the, the the album just did seem just okay. Like just a lot of a lot of simply put together pop hits that would be played in clubs or they would hope stadiums maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean totally stadiums, totally stadium rock. Yeah. I I definitely agree and with and the and just okay thing. Yeah, that's that's a big problem for me. That, that that's harder than the non lyrics thing. Is is bands who write songs that are designed to be played in front of fifty thousand people. Because intimacy is vitally important in those kind of connections with music for me, and it, and it's very hard to get past that. So, um, so yeah, I, I was kind of stuck on that, unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, okay. but I will say we're still in not able to explore. We haven't yet explored why pop is such a dirty word in this podcast. Uh, in I mean, cases. I don't think it. I don't think that it is. Is it? I think no. it's. There's been a lot of pop we've enjoyed. I think it's, um, you know, none of us are... I mean, Matt is quite a big pop fan. I think... I don't think pop's a dirty radio. I think you... When you say this podcast, I think you mean yourself, Nick. Right. Maybe I do yeah. myself. I, mean, I think I said last time that I was, I was sort of trying to get my head around why that was the case yeah. for me. But I do think all three of us have, have used that phrase in the last... Yeah, I think... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think it's the different. There's different kinds of pop, right? There's the mm. almost the genre, and then there's the chart. Yeah, and the stuff that's aiming for number one, but it's actually aiming for it as opposed to stuff that is, of of that ilk, but inventive and interesting. Mm. Mm. And sometimes those unite together, and a lot of times, um, you end up with something like this, which is designed to sell records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but. I, I do urge you to watch that documentary and watch it back. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I think Michael Hutchins it. actually as a as a writer and as a um, you know it's not my cup of tea this music necessarily. I, I got more out of it than I expected to, but as a writer, I, d- I don't think it's just designed to sell records and to fill stadiums. I think there is quite a lot there with him as well, and I think there was also quite a lot of pressure in some ways for him to do some of that more. There's a really interesting part of the documentary where he wants to go off and do his own solo record, and he does, and the bit that I heard wasn't great. But he wanted to go and do something different, something darker. But he's kind of, with his mental health and his makeup, and he was kind of just pressured into doing yeah, stuff like that's... that. And I think he still managed to write some pretty good tunes, considering someone who was having a a bit of a breakdown throughout most of his career. So I think it's actually, yeah, I, I think maybe I'm being a bit leaning on it because of seeing the documentary and stuff. But mm-hmm. actually, I think... I think there's yeah, more to I, it than, and, and than and you two are saying. This is why I felt uncomfortable, you know, because I know the situation. I don't know the documentary, but I will. I will definitely watch it. But I, mm. I definitely know the circumstances were very sad and, and tragic, and therefore, you know, it makes me makes it more difficult to to say that Still, I found the yeah. album to be just okay. You know. Yeah, and that's yeah. fine. Just well, yeah, it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with criticizing the album just because of the circumstances. I think it's um, you know, it's a yeah. classic. I think they've sold a lot of. A lot of records, and I think yeah, Mary, okay. Matt's, girl, Matt's wife has most of them, so <laughs> I think yeah. they'll cope with us not being the, you know, the biggest fans. But yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's interest, it is interesting, and I will watch the documentary to to see a tale of like miss missed potential and things like mm. that. But it d- doesn't mean that we can. I'm like objectively approaching the album, yeah, uh, and as a, as a singular entity, um, and I don't think that the album itself stands up, but mm. and. I'll be interested to hear about his, yeah, the tale behind it. Yeah. Cool. Okay, should we move on? Yeah. So good. I'm yes. going to start us off with Grimes' Anthropocene, I think. Um, so mm. I miss felt... Anthropocene, I must just correct you because you said it twice it? correctly now. Yes. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Miss Anthropocene then. Um, I missed that word. Um, that was a terrible joke, but, you know, you can laugh we'll if you want. We'll just move on um, to it. So I felt really tricked by this album in some ways. I felt like it started with a really good song, really involving um, So Heavy I Fell Through the Earth. And then I quite liked the second song, which I think is called Dark Seed. Maybe it's called Miss Dark Seed. I don't know. It's got this (laughs) 
really good sort of rumbling bass line and I was kind of thinking, oh, I'm, I'm really into this. It was um, reminding me a bit of sort of FK Twigs and some of similar stuff. And then I just thought it totally, totally fell off a cliff really quickly. I think Delete Forever is dreadful. Um, I think it totally spoils any atmosphere that the first two songs have mm. built up. I think it's like a child's been given a guitar and a pen and gone and made a song. It's so poor. Um, and there really, really isn't anything else that works for me after that, with the slight exception of You'll Miss Me When I'm Not Around. I think at least that's kind of a fun pop song. Um, I've mentioned Chelsea Wolf before today, and for me, it reminded me of that in the way that it feels so inauthentic and plasticky. Um, and I think we've listened to some pop albums. We're talking about pop again, but we've listened to some pop albums recently that have really surprised me. Um, Billie Eilish particularly, I love. Ariana Grande, I expected to hate, and I, I thought was pretty good. Um, I think they felt really authentic and really emotional. And this one, this feels really fake and sort of just someone saying some words over some basic keyboard tunes. Um, so of all the stuff I'd heard about it, I was quite excited for this one. And I, that's why I wanted, you know, I asked if anyone wanted to put it on the playlist. Um, but it was a massive disappointment to me. I, I really didn't like it. Who wants to go? Cool. Matt, you're already a fan of Grimes, aren't you? So should we hear from you? Yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of Grimes. And I think the previous work she's done is uh, fantastic. Yeah. Even... Um, the previous two albums were in consideration for they were on my short list of albums of the decade oh um, really wow. wow so yeah I'm obviously a big fan in that regards but I think this for me was almost a not a step back as in worse but a step mm. back in her trajectory she's been going from this very experimental um, over the past like four albums to something her last album was just full blown pop and it was fantastic yeah. at doing what it what it was doing um and so this felt like it was taking a little step back away from that uh how poppy it was prior uh, a little bit more weirder um and she swapped in the kind of euphoria that i feel surrounded a, a lot of her music for something darker and more mm. ominous um and so for me that it just didn't quite work out as well um okay. this she always had a despite the kind of euphoric sense um, she always seemed to have this kind of um like an anarchistic side to her like she felt like she was doing something different and she was anti um now i don't i find it hard to separate her from her life now and mm. the fact that she is uh, shacked up with one of the most influential capitalistic ma men in the world. Yeah. Um, I think it just makes this whole album a little more disingenuous if she's kind of talking about the end of the world and things like that, and then she's with someone who's part of that system. Mm. Um, it just, I don't know, it just doesn't line up to me. Um, that said, there were some, some songs in here I really liked. Um, I think You'll Miss Me When I'm, I'm Not Around and My Name Is Dark are like peak grime songs. They have this really driving bass through them that uh, kind of drives drives the whole song forward and then helps ground her a little bit. I think she needs something strong in the music to help ground her voice, which is kind of ethereal um, quite often when she sings. And so I think that's when she's at her best. And that's in the album, but too often not there. Okay. Um, it's all around a little bit disappointed, but there's still some nuggets. Okay. Nick? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, it made me very sad, Fran, when you said when you mentioned FK Twigs. Uh, yeah. It really, it really made me sad that you, that there was that connection there, and I did think it wasn't staggering that anyone would think that. To I me, think what that album... came from for me is because I'd heard them compared quite a lot before. So when I first listened yeah. to the first couple of songs, which I didn't, I liked the first two songs. I was kind of looking for that connection a little bit, I think, and maybe found it when you get it. As I went through the album, it's definitely not there. I don't it sound, think. It sound like you don't want to make me sad, which I'm kind of surprised by. But okay, thanks for <laughs> that. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I, I do think I can see where where Grimes is trying to be like FK Twigs, and like a lot of people are right now. But this is much more pedestrian, I think. Um, mm, yeah, totally. And 
an example would be Dark Seed, actually the second song, um, which is uh, screaming FK Twigs experimentalism. Um, <clears throat> and then as you mentioned, um, Fran, Delete Forever completely sort of lifts a veil oh, off the album and reveals yeah. that the weirdness is very, very surface kind of gives away the fact that weirdness is very, very surface and it's just addressing over what is basically just a very uh, average chorus, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus kind of uh, series of guitar tunes, really, and synth tunes. So I was totally yeah. expecting you both to get your, your verses and choruses from this album, by the way. I really expected I know, that. But, I thought that yeah. might, be, yeah. might be a possibility, yeah. So, um, so yeah. Uh, what I was going to say, the there is so much. You, I think you said a voice was ethereal, Matt. Yeah, there's yeah. so much reverb on a voice. This is going back to a literary comment as well. Actually, the the the, the problem with the, the reverb like this is it is so distancing for the listener. It's such. It's like I feel like I'm listening to the, to her with a duvet over the, my stereo. Like I just don't mm, understand yeah. why she sounds so far away all the time. Wants to do so. What it makes me suspicious of. Is that she's trying to mask something? That's what that's you know literally mask something um, with with this with this sort of cloak of reverb on it over all the, the tone. So it doesn't mean that I'm not saying she's not a good singer. I, I honestly don't know one way or the other. I don't have an opinion on that. But just from the point of view of the whole structure of the song, when you dress it in that much reverb, unless you're very very clever about it, I think it just comes across as both unaffecting because it's so far away from everybody. And also potentially thin, like there's, you're just trying to make it sound like there's more going on. It's like, it's like when you see a band and they like spray the 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 um, what's that called? The smoke they spray in the in the venues, you know, like the yeah, the, yeah. Smoke the dry, ice, dry ice, the dry ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they spray tons and tons of the dry ice all over the venue, and you can barely see the band at all, and they're just like coming out of the mist. And that's fine to do a little bit of that, but to me, that just always, always makes me think, well, why why can't they just stand there? And like perform like if the song's really good. That do they need that? You know, do they need this? And I feel the same way about this really. So it, it was a problem for me. Um, the the reverb tone and particularly in the in the first song is the most extreme example, but in lots of the songs on this album. And then the four what is that four a.m. Um, mm. that one yeah. yeah with that with that character I'm not familiar with. Like, is it a Greek character? Anyway, um, I thought <laughs> that was really um, a good example of how thrown together some of the parts were. It seemed like it was. A kind of a bit of a uh, tons of reverb, like big beats, just just all over the shop. Like I said earlier on with the other album, um, with it, with, H, with HM LTD, it's um, it's not really got a trajectory that that's very clear and doesn't seem to be very intentional. It seems to be like throwing a lot of ideas at the wall. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my feelings on it. I, I was I was pretty disappointed. I didn't really have a strong opinion one with the other. I didn't know her before. Um, mm. Except, yeah, I mean, I, I knew her fame from uh, Elon, whatever his name is. Uh, but I don't know anything Elon about her otherwise. I didn't have any, any opinion one with the other on all that stuff. But uh, I do think it's a pretty weak album that doesn't certainly... I'm not saying you're saying this, Fran, but, you know, FK Twigs is yeah, a yeah. planet. So, on every sense of the yeah, word. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, that's it for me I on think that one. There was a point where they could have been peers and they... Uh, FK Twigs kept moving forwards um, and Grimes decided to go towards a more pop aesthetic. Right. Yeah. Which she, she absolutely nailed. Um, but mm. now I'd say some of like her experimentalism isn't necessarily a copy. It's what, where she came from, but okay. it's um, maybe not what she's the best at now. And it's not as new and interesting anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Okay. All right, should we talk about the uh, the playlist as a whole then? Um, what did we think of it? And what was your favourites? I think you both said your favourites, but let's have it anyway. What Matt, playlist as a whole and favourite? I don't know. Like After talking about it, I feel like I was more positive than I felt while listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> just, trying to, just trying to do it like a yin-yang with Fran's unbelievable negativity. Yeah, I don't know. I, Honestly. Broadly, broadly, I wasn't. It didn't. I wasn't excited to listen to the playlist that much, and I didn't listen to it as much as I would normally. And yeah. it wasn't drawing me in. I don't know if that's the circumstance, which we. Uh, being no, it's the playlist. The it's the playlist. But, but yeah. We'll yeah. T- we'll, the next, the next one will be a judge, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this was the worst playlist we have ever done. Um, so I think 
that and crossed stuff with the circumstances. Just, broken all records then, that's interesting. I mean, there wasn't in excess four songs and in excess were the only things that I enjoyed on mm. on this <laughs> on this playlist. Um, and maybe God. half a song on on Grimes. Um, yeah, so it, your, yeah. Your it was, high point was in excess. Yeah, in excess was my favourite album on this by a considerable margin, actually. Um, wow. I hated everything. Well, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. All right, I did hate everything else. I mean, Square Pusher, I don't want to be too harsh on because I feel like it's probably good at what it's doing, but it wasn't for me. Um, HMLTD, I hated, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was really bad, really bad. Not what I needed in these last few weeks, which is why you may have noticed about two and a half weeks ago, I was saying, please, can we do another playlist? Yeah. Uh, I just yeah. needed something else, I desperately. Much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really doing my head in. Uh, but, yeah, how about you, Nick? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say I don't know worst one we've done, but it, it was it was not a great selection of music all in all. Uh, Square Pusher, uh, I enjoyed, but I you know I'm not going to go back to it all the time. Against the Logic uh, had some good bits, definitely, but um, the other three um, I, I won't be returning to. Um, so yeah, I, I wasn't really wasn't really a big fan. Um, yeah, and I'd already said what my favourite one was on there. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. All right, then, I suppose I'll tell you why I love Aldous Harding, the one, the one good piece of music that we had this month. Um, <laughs> so for me, right, okay, I discovered Aldous Harding in the same way I discover a lot of my music these days. I was, I'd made a playlist of all the uh, people who were playing at Green Man Festival back in 2017, and I had it on random, and the song Hunter, which was near the start of this playlist, playlist came on. I was totally grabbed by it straight away. It's it's my thing. Um, you know, some simple but beautiful guitar under a strong, interesting female vocal. Um, so I listened to that first album a lot, um, and I put three of those songs on this playlist at the start. Um, but while we were waiting to see her at Green Man, um, she released her second album, which is called Party. Um, I was very excited to listen to it, but I expected more of the same. I expected some interesting, pretty folk music that I would love personally but wouldn't necessarily be anything that original or that out there. But um, but Party was like nothing I'd really heard before. I think musically it is still folk music, but she does some stuff with the genre that I haven't heard people do before. There's a sort of real oddity to that album, and that sort of became her, her trademark, and it was a trend that continued with the third album, Designer. She's only got three albums. Um, she changed it up again with that album and got even weirder. Um, so while we were waiting to see her at Green Man, we ended up going to see her at Ruby Lounge in Manchester, which is now sadly closed. Um, but that gig had a really, really strange vibe because it was the night after the bombing at Manchester Arena. So it was kind of a strange atmosphere. There was a real tension in the air and she tried her best to break through that. But the set was a bit flat because of that, I think. Um, but then we saw her at Green Man, and after seeing that, I think she's probably my favourite performer on the planet right now. Um, she played the third stage at Green Man, and on that stage, there's always a compare who introduced the acts. And the woman who introduced that day, I just felt so sorry for her because um, she did this long speech about how she was introducing this amazing new act and how it was one of her favourite singers of all time. And then instead of calling her Aldous Harding, she called her Aldous Huxley, which is the name of the guy who wrote Brave New World. Um, <laughs> obviously, a lot of people in the crowd Fantastic. laughed. Uh, it was very, very awkward. But this moment became my introduction to what a fascinating character Aldous Harding is because she walked on the stage looking like she wanted to murder this woman. Like, mm. she was looking daggers at her. And you could see the woman going really bright red and looking really awkward. And then kind of Aldous just sat down on a stool and just delivered her set with the most intense look on her face, pulling all these crazy distorted faces that she always pulls. Wow. And I couldn't decide as I was stood on the front row, uh, I couldn't decide whether I was having the best time of my life or whether I was generally terrified. I, I, I didn't know what was going on really. And for me, that leads me before we even get to the music to one of the reasons why I'm so obsessed with Aldous Hardin. Um, I don't know if either of you got the chance to watch the interview of, of yes. the live sets. So, uh, uh, did you, Matt? Yeah. 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 yeah I so I think that interview that I sent you, you might be thinking, why have you sent me this? Because it's the prime example of why she doesn't do a lot of interviews. I think it's generally one of the most awkward things I've ever seen in my life. Um, so I looked up that interview after seeing her live with my dad because um, me and my dad and Kirsten went to a British Summertime Festival 
we saw her um, perform again there. And afterwards, my dad asked me if it was all a show, like what she puts on or if she's that weird in real life. And I didn't have an answer. So I looked up that interview and I came away thinking, yeah, she is really that mad. She's so uneasy, so awkward. But then she sings and she performs and she just becomes someone else. And I really love that with musicians and actors and any any sort of artist. I love seeing people who use their tool, whatever it is, in this case, music, to sort of combat all those things they find difficult and anxiety provoking. And I think I don't think I've ever seen a better example of that than her. But I think that oddness of her personality really translates into her music. Um, so I think one of the things I love about her the most, about her music the most, is that even when I haven't got the foggiest clue what she's talking about in the music, I still find it totally captivating. Uh, her lyrics are amazing, but I, when I really love them is when they're totally bizarre. So I've just picked out two examples of lyrics I totally love, even while I wonder what on earth she's going on about. And there's loads more I could have gone with. But in the song, What If Birds Aren't Singing, They're Screaming, she opens with the verse, I got high, I thought I saw an angel, but he was just a ghost. He was making wooden posts out of my family. So like, I don't know what she's talking about, but I just love the image. She just paints this amazing, amazing image. And then there's the song, The Barrel, which might be my favorite song by her. Uh, it's a lyrical mystery throughout, but I particularly love the following section where she says, it's already dead. I know you have the dove. I'm not getting wet. Looks like a date is set. Show the ferret to the egg. I'm not getting led along. I just like, what the hell is she talking about? Show the but ferret yeah, to the egg. Still... That makes total sense. From Show the ferret about. to it's the obvious. egg. It's amazing. It's amazing. When I heard that line, when I first heard that song, I was just like, oh, I love this. Um, and the final point I want to make before moving on to you guys and see what you thought about it. Um, actually, let me just talk about, about the barrel again, because the video that I sent you, the music video <laughs> I sent you is the barrel. Just for another yeah. example of what a weird human we're dealing with. That video is insane, isn't it? Yeah. Really like she is. just this, anyone who hasn't seen it, she does this kind of crazy dance in a sort of black dress and a hat keeps growing. And at the end, she's just got this crazy red face. And I must have, like, this mask that she puts on, and I must have watched that video 400 times trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And I, and I haven't, and I love it. Um, but yeah, the final point I want to make before going on to you guys is, is something, that, something else that marks her out and makes her unique. And that for me is her vocal delivery. Obviously, she has a totally stunning voice, and when she's singing her more traditional songs, that voice just seems like a traditional, beautiful singing voice. But what I love it, love about it is that she's not afraid to do these oddball, bizarre things with it, things that other singers might think would put people off. So there's the screech in which she says the word party in the title song from the second album, the strange accent in which she sings the whole song, Designer, and the way she almost whistles the line, You were psyching me out on Weight of the Planets. I think it's just another factor that makes a really oddball, fascinating character, who I think is really testing the limits of a genre that it's quite hard to push the limits in, because folk music has its limits and it has its structures, but she's really testing that. And then with the live performances and the videos, it just makes her this really intriguing character. So for me, all of that, on top of all the, the fact that all those these songs are just amazing, make her probably my favourite discovery of the last five years. So yeah, I'm a big, big fan. But but that's enough for me. Uh, who wants to tell me what they thought? I'm interested. Matt? I'll go. I'll go. Shall Nick. I? Nick. Yeah. I'll Nick. Go. Yeah. Go. Go. Um, yeah. So uh, I thought I haven't got tons to say except that this is a really stunning playlist, all in all. Um, and I am pleased you sent through those videos because I I totally understand what you're saying about the eccentricity yeah. which, that she saw bases all are working. Um, in fact, when you were saying that about the about the awkwardness of the interview and that. It reminded me, I know it's not exactly the same kind of music, but it reminded me of Hendrix, actually, who I understand mm. was painfully shy a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. the awkward interviews and mm. then went on stage and did all that insane stuff. So, um, yeah, no. It's How sorry different. do you feel for that interview, though? That interview, I'm oh, just yeah. like, oh, my God, oh, yeah. this must be so hard, yeah. man. <laughs> different, a different persona altogether when she's on stage and, and one yeah. that's, that's, you know, but they're both compelling in a way. One's compelling like a road accident and one's compelling like a like an incredible performance, you know, so when, mm. she's, on, when she's on stage singing. Um, her voice is um, is really beautiful and very much, um, it sounds very 70s somehow to me. It sounds like mm. Carpenters-esque, you know, and, and and that's not a bad thing at all. That's that's something um, I, I could really get into. And I found it very, as, it's very consistent across the whole playlist, both her voice and the performances in general. The playlist is, I see what you're saying about pushing the genre, the genre a little bit, but... Mm. Um, to that, I can see, I think, what you're saying, but in general, it's still very much, it's a folk playlist, 
and it's yeah. a very very solidly consistent one you can play it and if you're into that into that mode in that mood i should say where you want to hear that kind of music this will be gold standard material all the way through it doesn't drop off it you know just really it really just sounds fantastic all the way through so um i think it, one thing i loved about it one thing that i think whenever i've heard good folk which I, i'm learning more about from fran really honestly mm. um mm. is when it plays with silence a lot um yeah is when it when it really and i remember actually the one time i've seen uh aldous home which was with you fran um, yeah. And I went into the gig having never heard her. I made a point of actually just going in completely blind. Um, it, the silence in the room was unbelievable. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. It was pin drop quiet to the point where she was seemingly getting a bit frustrated that you could hear the other venue, which is like through like <laughs> a six foot wall of concrete, um, like the base end of the, of, the, of the rock band in the next room slightly in a tiny, tiny bit, you know. Um, it was so quiet in there and I think the way she does that and that control is really really fascinating so yeah. um, Heaven is Empty uh, the last one on the on the place I think and then also Party the, the track Party is, itself yeah. uh, which is probably my favourite song on the playlist actually was Party um, you know does that real that, that, that control that incredible control and that, that willingness to know that silence is as important as, as noise if you're trying to make a song that has an arc and has, has dynamics you know um, so actually, if you're going to go as low as silent, actually you have an enormous amount of dynamics. Even if you make just you know just pluck in one string is, is an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. Definitely more yeah. than that. So it, it gives you a huge range when you're able to do that. So so yeah, it's very much within a genre. It's very much uh, genre leading though to me. Uh, you know, I haven't yeah. heard much better than this in this genre in a lot. You know, maybe ever. I don't know. It's wow. up there. Um, so I loved it. Really loved it. Um, and it was really nice. Uh, after a playlist that was yeah. either not good or if it was good, very hard to listen to in lots of ways to have something that was so moving and warm and close after all that, you know, Grimes is massive reverb and uh, HMLTDs, yeah. you know, massive kind of eccentricities and stuff. This yeah. was very much clearly a, an amazing set of uh, folk music. So, yeah. Great. I mean, just when talking about the silence, that's really interesting. It's not something I thought about, but I can totally totally see that and it's interesting watching her a couple of those gigs I've talked about when I was right up at the front you can see how much work she puts into setting up the the stage and setting up the equipment and how she's so particular about the tiniest little nuance and that is I think for what the reasons you're talking about is when she uses silence the way she does if she then goes on to make the tiniest sound with something it for her it has to sound absolutely perfect I would to get the effect that be... she wants I would not want to be in her band for any amount of time. <laughs> that must be so fucking stressful. Uh, because of her mentality and also because of that amount of control that's needed. I've always thought yeah, this yeah, about Portishead as well, actually, that being Adrian Atley in Portishead, the guitarist, he's, he's just plucking two strings for the entire song. Yeah. If he gets that wrong, it's going to really fuck things up, you know? So, yeah, yeah similar yeah. kind of mentality, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, um, Matt? Matt? I, think, I think you can, yeah... You, you talk about uh, that control and the intensity that she has. I think you can see that in all aspects, like in her interviews, everything that mm. she is saying. One of the reasons it's so awkward is she, she'll she sit and think about a question for 30 yeah, yeah, seconds yeah, yeah. in a conversation. <laughs> and then she'll forget what the question was. And then was. tell her it's a shit question. Time, she, was like, she was like, sorry, what? Yeah, she either tell her the shit or she'll be like, what was the question again? I can't remember what you were yeah. saying. Because she wants yeah. to get it right. So I think she genuinely wants to get it right, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Even on the KXP, very... in between the in between the songs, when the person on KXP yeah. asks the questions, it's the same thing. It's mad, but yeah. Sorry, carry yeah. on. Matt. It's yeah. It's so, so considered and purposeful. It's uh, yeah. The KXP thing is funny because it was yeah. She'd speak for thirty seconds in this question, and then she'd get <laughs> a big pause, and then like three words. But that's <laughs> I guess all she wanted to say for that. Uh, <laughs> for that uh question um, oh, I love it. but broadly the the music to me i i i liked it a lot um i think she was best when it was more than just her vocals and her guitar i think when there was stuff like in uh hunter you have some strings mm. or in uh in imagine my imagining my man you have a bit of woodwind in there i think mm. that really supports what she's doing and then you get to the the more, uh, I think probably more for me more interesting stuff later on in the playlist. Um, as she's doing this, I think what you're saying about her weirdness and yeah. eccentricities. The more she buyed into that, the more I was buying to her. Mm. Um, and so yeah, the barrel is the best track by. That was amazing. It's by a long way, I think. Um, 
And so, I yeah, I think generally I I wasn't swept away by the entire playlist. Um, there were moments where it was a bit more remote and bare, mm. where it reminded me too much of Julian Baker. Oh God, um, I hate Julian Baker. Don't say that. Yeah, and then so I didn't. I don't mean that as like a complete like. <laughs> Like Julian Baker's obviously fantastic. She can sing fantastically. She can uh, play a mute instrument fantastically and creates these beautiful, uh, beautiful songscapes, much like uh, Aldous. Um, but it just sometimes just wasn't enough for me to buy mm. it. I think that's where our our tastes differ, right? Yeah. I mean, um, I think Design of the Fire, the third album, if it would be the one where you would probably connect with her the most in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. As the playlist went on, I got more and more into mm. it. Um, so an abridged version of this playlist is probably the perfect one for me. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad I'm, I've heard her name for a long time, so I'm glad I got to finally figure out what she is actually about. Cool. Cool. Okay. Nice. I think that's, that's us. I'm glad you both got something out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for putting it together. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Cool. Okay, so we talk about next time? Yes. He is. So, you will be hosting Nicholas, won't you? Do you want to start us? Well, I would try, except for the fact that I know that we're doing a Neil Young album. Uh, and I thought a minute ago, oh, I can't remember the name of the Neil Young album. So I went into Spotify to, to scan down the albums. He's got like literally 50 albums. So what's it's the name Harvest. of the album? <laughs> It's Harvest. We're doing Harvest. harvest. Thank you very yeah, much. Not Harvest Moon, because he's got Harvest and Harvest Moon, and we're doing oh, Harvest. harvest. <laughs> okay. <Really>? So, yeah. <laughs> so um, Neil Young's Harvest um, will be the classic. And I will be hosting uh, a playlist about why I love the horrors. Cool, cool. Matt? Cool. Um, I've picked Childish Gambino with his new release, 31520. And also Jesse Reyes with Before Love Came to Kill Us. Cool. So I've picked uh, Porridge Radio. We were a Brighton band, Matt. I don't know if you know that. Um, uh, yeah. With their album, Every Bad. And uh, Brooke Bentham's Everyday Nothing. So yeah, that'll be next time. Great. So yeah. Okay. Nice one. Thanks, Thanks for cool. listening. Thanks for listening, Thanks guys. Thanks very much. See ya. Bye. Bye.